good evening everyone a, a very warm welcome to this first inaugural master class of the asia pacific glaucoma society this is being hosted by the society for further of scientific education to the ophthalmic community and today we are very delighted that we have a world renowned speaker with us dr ki ho from south korea who will be highlighting on how to use the oct in your clinic currently and in the future now the asia pacific glaucoma society is one of the key societies for furthering the cause of glaucoma education both in the asia pacific region as well as worldwide and we have now a lot of registration benefits for the people who want to join the society so if you become a member you get a free access to our online educational program we also have a quarterly newsletter there is also an online community related to glaucoma drainage devices migs genetics chronic angle of the glaucoma where you can interact with the top experts in the field of glaucoma you also have a free online access to the journal of glaucoma of the world glaucoma association you can participate in the electoral process and be on the committees of the apgs and you are also eligible for the awards and recognition from the asia pacific glaucoma society so currently our website has been updated we have a lot of online educational content with pre recorded webinars co-hosted by the asia pacific glaucoma society and the american glaucoma society the european glaucoma society the international society for glaucoma surgery and we have video assisted skill transfer course that is so that the trainee surgeons can learn the various techniques of glaucoma surgery related to trabeclectomy mids glaucoma drainage devices and various diagnostic techniques so i would encourage all of you to visit our website and avail the membership benefits so today we have with us professor ki ho who is the president of the asia pacific glaucoma society he is a professor of ophthalmology at the seoul national university and also the president of the korean ophthalmology society he is a associate editor of the journal of glaucoma and the section editor for various reputed journals and also on the editorial board of iobs as you know he has taken over as the president of our society and is also the president elect of the glaucoma research society he has served on the board of governors of the world glaucoma association and as a co-chair of the world glaucoma congress 2017 scientific program and as a convener for the world of thalli congress so he is truly a world renowned clinician scientist with over 300 papers published in peer reviewed journals he has also been awarded the american academy of ophthalmology senior achievement award the apa achievement award and various other distinguished medals to his credit so i present to you today professor ki ho for the inaugural master class of the asia pacific glaucoma society on how to use oct in your current practice and in the future so over to you professor ki ho it is my great honor and pleasure having an opportunity to provide a lecture at the first apgs master class lecture i'll be sharing with you how can oct help your glaucoma clinic now and in future glaucoma is known as a leading cause of blindness worldwide in glaucoma the optic nerve is damaged with loss of retinal ganglion cells and their axons and there is characteristic loss of visual field which corresponds with the structural damage classically to diagnose glaucoma we look into the optic nerve head and perform functional test using perimetry 
nowadays, in addition to looking at the optic nerve head, we also evaluate the retinal nerve fiber layer by photograph or using imaging de device like OCT, as well as the inner retinal layer of the macula where the retinal ganglion cell bodies are located. This is the first telephone invented by Graham Bell in 1876, which is developed very fast. And this is the first cell phone. And now we can put it on our wrist. So the technology develops very fast beyond our imagination. It may be true in diagnostic technology as well. OCT in ophthalmology has been evolved very fast as well since the first OCT prototype shown in 1993. This is the first paper our group has shown that the correlation between the RNFL photography and the time domain OCT results. The RNFL defects could be detected by the normative database of the time domain OCT. Preperimetric glaucoma is an early stage of glaucoma in which there is characteristic glaucomatous structural loss, but no functional loss by standard automated perimetry. This is the paper comparing spectral domain and time domain of CT in patients with preperimetric glaucoma. Figure A is an example showing that both spectral domain and time domain OCT detect RNFL defects. However, in figure B, because it is too early case with smaller widths of RNFL defect, time domain OCT could not detect it, while spectral domain OCT could. When we look at the inner retina of the macula area, the cell body of the retinal ganglion cell is located in the ganglion cell layer, and the dendrites are in the inner plexiform layer, and the axons are in the no fiber layer. The retinal ganglion cell complex is composed of no fiber layer, ganglion cell layer, and inner plexiform layer. These three layers are called ganglion cell complex, and we call two layers of ganglion cell layer and inner plexiform layer as GCIPL in the serous OCT. Normally in healthy eyes, the GCIPL thickness map shows a donut shaped symmetrical appearance as shown in the right eye. If there is a glaucomatous defect in the ganglion cell layer and inner plexiform layer, this symmetrical pattern is broken as shown in the left eye and the deviation map from normative database shows defects. This is a case of a lady in which the disc hemorrhage was detected by chance in the routine health checkup in 2009. Fortunately, she had her previous fundus photograph of 2006, which showed no definite abnormality. Her intraocular pressure was 16. She was followed up for more than 13 years Two episodes of recurrent disc hemorrhage were detected in 2012 and 2016 in the inferotemporal neuroretinal ring. You can find the RNFL defect has developed later and progressed in the region of disc hemorrhage. The visual fields by standard automated perimetry were within normal limits until 2016, while the retinal nofibal layer and GCIPL loss has been already detected in 2012, and they continuously progressed until 2019. This is another case in which glaucomatous early RNFL defect was detected and progressed. You can see recurrent disc hemorrhage and corresponding RNFL defect in the inferotemporal region. This early RNFL defect could be detected by the normative database of the OCT, and the progression could be detected by the guided progression analysis called GPA. 
So the deviation map from the normative database and GPA analysis are a kind of artificial intelligence with which the OCT can help us to detect and monitor glaucoma. The visual field defect was detected at the last part of the follow-up. I frequently compare the retinal ganglion cell as a bean sprout. Back to the case of a 58 year old lady, there was a huge GCIPL loss in the macula area compared to the smaller RNFL defect at the stage of normal visual field. The large area of defect compared to the RNFL defect can be explained by the bean sprout model as the volume of the cell bodies is larger than the volume of axons. We, now, we know that in glaucoma, the visual field defect is asymmetrical across the horizontal rapi, as you can see in the glaucoma hemifield test. Similarly, the same principle can be applied to the GCIPL thickness. The right-hand side figure is showing the custom software developed to perform GCIPL hemifield test to detect glaucoma and showing a positive temporal rapi sign. The healthy eye in the first row showed normal GCIPL hemifield test in perimetric glaucoma with very early inferotemporal RNFL defect in the second row case showed asymmetrical GCIP loss in the corresponding region with the outside normal limits results. The early glaucoma case in the third row uh, showed RNFL defect in vi and uh, visual field loss and outside normal limits in the GCIPL hemifield test. This is another case in which the RNFL defect might have been missed with the conventional spectral domain OCT scan as shown in the upper figures. But it can be detected by swept source OCT as you can see in the lower figures. Wide field OCT imaging is another good option to detect early change. The OCT in the right hand side might have missed the RNFL defect if it had been performed by conventional macular and peripapillary scan because the defect is outside the area of the scan. When we integrate the peripapillary RNFL map with the macular GCIPL map, we can get more information in glaucoma progression. In this case, GCIPL change was detected earlier than the RNFL change. This is an opposite case where the RNFL change was detected earlier than the GCIPL change. Temporal relation between uh, macular GCIPL loss and peripapillary RNFL loss in glaucoma has been studied. After three years follow-up of 94 eyes with the GCIPL loss, the corresponding RNFL defect was detected in about 20%. In contrast, after a three-year follow-up of 52 eyes without GCIPL loss, the RNFL defect was appeared only in about 2%, which means that GCIPL change appears earlier in most cases in these QHIs in Korea. Recently, the researchers in Australia also has shown that the GCIPL loss is detected earlier than RNFL loss in normal tension glaucoma group compared to the high tension glaucoma group, which is quite similar to our Korean patient results where normal tension glaucoma is predominant in the population. I'm going to introduce a probability deviation map developed by Professor Don Hood at Columbia University using swept source OCT. Wide field scan is performed, including both macula and disc. 
Then the visual field test points were overlaid by the flip RNA and GCIPL thickness significance map called superpixel map. This map can assist in detecting the probability of future glaucoma progression in the patient's visual field. This is a 69-year-old gentleman with early glaucoma showing intertemporal RNA field defect. The RNA field thickness and GCIPL thickness probability maps were overlaid on the visual field. Even though the case was pre-perimetric glaucoma and having a normal visual field by standard automated perimetry, the suspicious points with decreased sensitivity exactly match with the structural defect in the probability maps. This is a 59-year-old gentleman with preperimetric glaucoma showing supertemporal and intertemporal RNFL defects. Even though the visual field was within normal limits in standard automated perimetry, the suspicious points were within the structural defects by probability map. An even more interesting finding was that after analyzing 43 cases of preperimetric glaucoma, the probability map could predict the future visual field progression in these eyes. Five years ago, our group firstly introduced the concept of lamina cribrosa curvature index, LCCI, which reflects how much the lamina cribrosa is posteriorly bold. The, the LCCI was calculated from the LC depth and anterior lamina insertion depth. The study found that the eyes with greater posterior bowing of LC at baseline showed a subsequent visual field progression. And the subsequent studies have confirmed this finding as well. This is the figure by Dr. Medeiros paper. As you can see, the change in visual field is slow in the early stage of glaucoma, which we call it as the ceiling effect. In contrast, the change in RNA field thickness is relatively faster than that in visual field in early stage and very slow in the advanced stage, which we call it as the floor effect. However, the flow effect starts in the very late stage of the advanced glaucoma. So even in most part of the advanced glaucoma, the RNA field thickness can play a role to detect progression. This is a report that, uh, there is a report that GCIPL could detect the progression in advanced glaucoma better than the RNA field defect because GCIPL thickness reaches the floor effect later than RNFL thickness. OCT can measure the neural retina rim width. Dr. Bal Shohan's group has proposed the BMO-MLW, the minimum distance between the Brooks membrane opening and the internal limit membrane. BMO-MLW showed significantly higher sensitivity at 95% specificity to detect early glaucoma than other parameters. A similar concept for BMMLW is in the serous OCT. It is three-dimensional neural retina rim thickness called calculated from the minimum cross-sectional area of the trapezoid located between the BMO and the vitreoretinal interface. It has been shown that the measurement of 3D and RR can be complementary to RNFL thickness measurement for differentiation of myopic glaucoma from myopic. If we recall the development of optics in telescope, the future of OCT can be optimistic as well. Artificial intelligence is the ability of a machine to mimic human cognitive functions. 
Machine learning has a narrow concept, meaning the ability of a machine to learn without needing to be explicitly programmed. Deep learning has a narrowest concept to represent the ability of a machine to learn using multi-layer neural networks modeled after the visual cortex. For deep learning in glaucoma imaging, the optic nerve images pass a feature learning and classified as glaucoma or non-glaucoma according to the probability calculated through the hidden layers. Because of these hidden layers, we do not clearly know how the machine decides the image to be glaucomatous or not. Our team utilized a method called ensemble training in which both GCIPL and RNFL thickness and deviation maps, a total of four OCT images were fed into NASNet and classified as glaucomatous or non-glaucomatous. The AURC was significantly greater than any of the single OCT parameter. Similarly, the deep learning algorithm discriminated glaucomatous and compressive optic neuropathy with significantly greater AURC than any other single OCT parameters. This is a study by Dr. Medeiros about an OCT trained deep learning algorithm for objective quantification of glaucomatous damage in fundus photographs. The heat map on the right side shows where the deep learning is looking for the quantification of RNFL thickness. The left side figure shows an example of the prediction of the RNFL thickness by deep learning and the actual RNFL thickness by OCT. We do not clearly know how the machine decides the image. We only depend on the heat map as shown in the left side figures. To build the heat map, occlusion tests are performed as shown in the right side figures. Recently, there has been a breakthrough to explain deep learning result called adversarial explanations. The picture on upper left is an original image of a concrete mixer trough. However, the deep learning output was a tow trough with a prediction value of 0.26. If the image has been changed like in the middle, the prediction value for the tow trough increased up to 0.98. And if a change was made into like an upper right image, the output was a trailer trough with the prediction value of 0.99. And if the image has been changed like in the middle of the second row, the first choice classification was a car with the prediction value of 0.75. So these adversarial examples may help understand how deep learning algorithm is classifying the image in addition to where on the image by heat map. Recently, our team has performed a study on the explainable deep learning using adversarial examples for glaucoma detection. More than Six thousands of fundus images of health screening patients were evaluated. Surveys for explanations using adversarial examples and the conventional heat map based GradCam method were done among the glaucoma specialists. Adversarial examples showed a significantly higher score for location and rationale explainability than heat map based GradCam. The first row shows the original fundus images. The heat map based GradCam negative and positive pathology images are in the nearby small windows. The second row shows the negative adversarial examples, and the third row shows the positive adversarial examples produced using only the predicted deep learning model and the original sample image. As you can see in the second row of the glaucoma negative adversarial examples, the cupping is decreased and the neural retina rim is increased. On the other hand, in the third row of glaucoma positive adversarial examples, the cupping is increased and the neural retina rim is decreased. So our study first has shown how deep learning algorithm is classifying glaucoma on fundus photographs. This figure is another example 
The left column is the original images of glaucoma case. For the case of the upper row, the positive adversary examples for glaucoma on the right column has shown that the cupping is increased and the new retina rim is decreased and the contour of the peripapillary atrophy becomes more mm -hmm. prominent. On the other hand, negative adversarial examples in the middle column is showing the opposite findings. For the case in the lower row, the positive adversarial examples of the glaucoma on the right column shows prominent RNFL defect, while negative examples does not. New technology makes our life better, but not always. OCT cannot detect this hemorrhage, as you can see in the image of OCT and RNFL photograph taken in the same patient. However, in future, the role of OCT will be expanded further, including portable and home OCT. These are take-home messages. In early glaucoma, RNFL and macular GCIPL defects are frequently detected before visual field defect by standard automated perimetry. In early glaucoma, macular GCIPL defect is frequently detected before corresponding RNFL defect, especially in NTG. Even in advanced glaucoma, structural change can be detected by OCT before reaching the floor effect. Wide field map by swept source OCT or combined map by spectral domain OCT may enhance early detection of glaucoma. AI may enhance the ability of fundus portal and OCT in glaucoma management. However, the final decision should be by doctor who integrates all the data, including direct observation of the patient. I'd like to thank all the participants who contributed to our research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kiho. That was really a fascinating journey of and tomography and its clinical utility in glaucoma presently and also in the future. So there are a couple of questions coming in from the audience. So I'll just be asking you these questions one by one. So the first question is by Dr. Zana, and that is how frequently do you recommend to do OCT in clinical practice if you are seeing a glaucoma patient? What is the frequency of OCT imaging? Yeah, very good question. Um, <clears throat> it depends on uh, the rate of uh, progression for the, for the patient. So if it is very stable case, I usually recommend once or twice per year but it is, if it is a very uh, fast progressing um, case, I would uh, recommend three or four times or more per year. Um, in normal tangent glaucoma, 
usually the patients are very stable. So in our um, routine health, uh, clinic, I usually do um, every six months or every, uh, every once a year. But uh, in more progressing cases, more, more fast progressing cases, we may do more frequently. But um, mm -hmm. usually I do not uh, um, perform OCT for every visit of the patient. But um, you, can, you can try, you can, you can do uh, both OCT and visual field at the si same time or you can, you can adjust the frequency according to your um, clinic's situation. Okay, thank you. The next question is by Dr. Nazrul Islam, our board member, that if you find a GCL IPA defect, but there is no RNFL defect, then how do you proceed? And do you start the patient on therapy or do you get a visual field done and supposing visual field is within normal limits? And would you start therapy if there is just a GCIPL defect on the OCT? Yeah, it's a, um, a very, very early case. I uh, suspect if there is a GCIPL defect, but without RNFL defect, uh, in mostly uh, in those cases, visual field may by uh, visual field by standard automated perimetry by 24-2 or 30-2, their visual field mostly are fields are normal. In those pre-perimetry cases, uh, we may follow up uh, uh, those those cases with the uh, uh, OCT and um, RNFL photography. And also you can try 10-2 for the central visual field, whether there is any early central uh, visual field defect. Um, in okay. those cases with the pre-perimetric glaucoma, uh, if the progression is not fast, we may follow up without treatment, but if the progression is very fast, even though the visual field is normal by standard automated perimetry, and if there is any disc hemorrhage, um, you, you, may, you may try um, to lower the pressure to slow down the progression. Okay. And the next question is by Dr. Lee Ching. How do you monitor a myopic glaucoma patient using OCT? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. Um, uh, let, me, let me share my um, slides um, because I did not cover the myopic glaucoma cases. So can you, can you share my screen? Can you see? Yeah, we are able to see your sc screen showing a swept source. Right, right. Imaging. So um, let me start with uh, a case. This is a case with uh, uh, highly myopia, minus six diopters, um, diopters, and axial length is 28. And you can see some red. Um, can you see the arrow pointer here? You can see um, the RNFL defect was in the six o'clock position. I think this is artifact because of the shifting of the inferior peak. However, the inferior temporal uh, red and yellow color, this uh, defect in the deviation map, it corresponds with GCIPL defect inferiorly here. And this is a very characteristic finding of glaucoma in uh, highly myopic eyes. So we need to differentiate uh, pseudo defect, we call that red disease, uh, from true defect. So true defect, you can see some um, GCIPL and intertemporal RNFL defect at the same time. 
So this is the case. And in RNA field photography, you can also find similar finding. But usually um, in highly myopic eyes, RNA field defect is not clearly seen. So that's the problem. Okay. Thank you. And, and uh, GCIPL hemifield test temporal rapid sign is another good clue to diagnose glaucoma in myopia. And we did some, some studies using uh, uh, comparing uh, SDOCT and swept source OCT. And we found some advantages of swept source OCT um, that uh, it can cover larger area that the spectral domain OCT GCA ganglion cell analysis cannot cover. So as you can see here in swept, swept source OCT, the defect is a super temporal area here, but um, ganglion cell analysis uh, could not detect it because the defect is outside uh, the ganglion cell analysis area. And in those early cases with the myopic glaucoma, um, do you treat this or not? It depends on how fast it progresses. If there is a fast progression, um, I would try to uh, lower the pressure in those eyes. But if it is quite stable and there is no change, um, you, may, you may observe it. If there is no high intraocular pressure, Okay. The pressure is low. If the pressure is low, I don't treat them. If it is stable, we may follow those patients. Thank you. The next question is by Dr. Alessandro. Uh, do you think the optic disc photograph will continue to have a role in glaucoma management? Yes, it is very, very important question. Um, I think um, disc photograph and retinal no fiber layer red free photographs are also very important. Nowadays, OCT is quite popular and we, we tend to depend on the OCTs, but um, OCT cannot detect this camera And we may miss um, many things if we do not perform photographs. And further, thanks to the deep learning, artificial intelligence, if we train OCT images, we can, we can predict no fiber layer thickness in photographs as well, if we train both photographs and OCT images. So, um, OCT is quite expensive instrument. So in, in near future, if we train both photographs and OCTs, we may get RNFL thickness in, from the fundus photographs as well. So um, now we may perform both photographs and OCTs and we can, we can get complementary results, clues from both techniques as well. Okay. I think both are very important. Okay. So in your clinical experience, does the structural damage of glaucoma always precede the visual field changes or can it be vice versa? Question by Dr. Nelson. Very, very good questions. Uh, in, uh, in our experience, structural detection, change, structural change detection is mostly earlier than standard automated perimetry, but vice versa case is also exist. So in some cases, um, early functional defect can be detected before structural change as well. But uh, in our normal tangent glaucoma cases, um, Thanks to the instrument technology, OCTs and RNFL photographies can detect very thin and early RNFL defects earlier than the standard automated perimetry. And also 
uh, even though the RNFL defect is not clear, the GCIPO ganglion cell complex thickness um, thinning is detected and very, very characteristic to glaucoma. So those can be a very good tool to detect early structural change, but we may not um, disemphasize the importance of functional tests. Okay. And uh, Professor Park, so when we do OCT, we should order retinal nerve fiber layer examination plus the ganglion cell examination. These two you have told us that we must do. And it, what is the role of doing a disc OCT angiography? Is, is that also now a part of the diagnostic regimen? Right. Um... Both RNFL analysis and ganglion cell analysis and minimum neuroretinal rim width is also very important. Those three um, items are very important for the structural diagnosis. But uh, today I did not cover the OCT and geography, but I prepared some uh, supplementary um, files. Let me, let me share this one. So um, this is a paper by Dr. Lee of our department. You can see the RNFL defect and um, decreased microvasculature location is quite correlated with. So which means um, OCT angiography um, microvasculature location uh, defect in the um, peripapillary scan is quite correlated with the location of RNFL defect. Further, um, deep layer um, microvasculature dropout, MVD, is quite correlated with the location of RNFL defect as well. So this kind of deep uh, layer MVD is um, located mostly in the peripapillary or parapapillary atrophy. So um, it is well known that the parapapillary atrophy and RNFL defect is um, topographically correlated with. So which means that uh, um, the defect in OCT and geography nowadays is quite correlated with the structural damage and peripapillary or parapapillary atrophy. So until now, the, those kind of uh, um, vascular loss is, um, I think it's a result of the nerve fiber or neural tissue damage. Um, but um, this is a recent paper by Dr. Weinreth's group that uh, the rate of uh, change in OCT and geography and um, just ganglion cell complex sickness, there was a discrepancy in advanced cases. So in advanced cases, uh, there's a floor effect in G ganglion cell complex thickness. So the, the rate is very slow, but uh, OCT and geography could, uh, could detect that, that kind of change quite uh, um, uh, more significantly. So in those cases with uh, advanced glaucoma, OCT angiography may help uh, to monitor progression of the cases. Okay. So uh, thank you, Professor Kiho. We have one time for one last question, and that is about fast progression. So we have patients who have progressed due to normal aging. So how to differentiate progression due to normal aging versus slow or fast progression on the OCT? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it also um, applied to the functional test as well, because if we plot the MD slope or VFI slope, um, it, it is decreasing and we, we need to determine this aging effect or is it, is it from the progression of glaucoma? So it, it needs um, statistical or normative database support or your clinical experience support. So um, if you think this kind of slope is 
it's natural. It's uh, because of aging. I see those cases in in normal as well. That that is that is uh, uh, that can be applied to OCT average RNA thickness change. So nowadays, uh, there is there are there is a guided progression analysis. We may uh, get help from assistant assistance from uh, those kind of GPA analysis, uh, similar to um, Humphrey visual field. Thank you, Professor Kiho. That was a really very enlightening talk and very thorough Q&A. So with that, we will conclude this uh, masterclass. I uh, profusely thank Professor Kiho for sparing his valuable time and starting this uh, uh, master classes on behalf of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. And I thank the audience for a very interactive participation and in sending in their questions. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society website. So if any one of you or your friends want to see this, you can log on to the website and have a look at this master class. And just before I conclude the session, just uh, two announcements from the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. So please mark your calendars for the next uh, masterclass that is on management of primary angle closure disease by Professor Clement Tham. That is on Saturday, 24th April. And please mark your calendars for this. And all our uh, previous classes and webinars are available on our website. And I would like to thank again, Professor Kiho for his excellent lecture. And this is a view of our website where you can log in and see all the videos, webinars, and the master classes are available here. And as you are all aware, that we are not going to have a physical meeting. So we are going to have the meeting of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society, the APGS Congress 2021 will be held all virtual from 4th to 8th of June. It, has, it is going to be a, a very comprehensive Glaucoma Congress. We have top speakers from all over the world. So please register for this. The registration is now open. 4th to 8th June 2021, it will be all virtual APGC Congress. So thank you once again. We look forward to hearing your comments and please log on to our website for more information.